Thanks, guys. Welcome, everybody. It's the HBC. Welcome here this evening and everybody at home. Uh, glad you're joining us. Uh, I got a few announcements this morning. The first one is we now have three worship service times. The first is on Thursdays at 7.30. For you who are here, you obviously know that. But for Sundays, we have two now at 9 o'clock and at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, for all these services, though, you need to register. You need to be able to get your, uh, your name and all your information in. So please do that through uh, emailing us at reservations at mychbc.ca. So another one, we have a men's ministry update. For the men's ministry, uh, events are going to look similar to last spring so far. There will be a Bible study hosted by Bob Reed on Zoom every Wednesday at 7 p.m. The study will be going through 1 Corinthians. And Wednesday morning studies hosted by John and Mark with a small breakfast may resume at the church. A startup date in October is being considered in light of evolving building use restrictions. So details may follow soon. Uh, to stay up to date on men's events and a copy of the link for the study, see the church website and the emailed bulletin. For women's ministry, I'm going to call up Kathy. Come on up and give us an update. Hi. I'm just going to let you know about the ladies' Bible studies that are starting up next week. We are going to be having ladies' morning out this year, but it's going to be sort of a modified version. It's going to look quite different from last year. We will still be having three Bible studies for you to choose from on Thursday mornings, uh, but we won't be gathering downstairs for that open muffin coffee uh, white cross bandage rolling session. We'll just be coming to the church and going straight to our studies. Um, depending on what study you're in, we're going, to, we're going to try to spread you out quite well throughout the church so that we can keep you as safe as possible and also stagger the start time so that cuts down on the traffic coming in and out. There will be a class in the sanctuary and you'll use just the main front doors and come right to your class starting at 9.15. There'll be another one starting at 9.15 in the main open area downstairs, and they'll come in through the downstairs entrance. And then there'll be one at 9.30 starting in the youth room. And so you would come in through the basement entrance and just go directly into the youth room. Uh, another difference is that we don't uh, have any child care. We can't offer child care this session. We're very sorry about that. But there is one study, and one study only, that is allowing moms to bring their toddlers and babies into it. So that might be an option for you. If it's not, we also have a study on Monday night. That's starting this coming Monday. It will be here in the sanctuary from 7 till 8.30. And there's information. I put a sheet up on the bulletin board just as you come in the door. So there's information about all the studies, what we're offering, who's teaching them, and also pre-registration uh, information because that's... We really want you to pre-register so we know how many people are going to be in each class because that will determine where we put you. So uh, if you have any other questions, you can call me or contact me after the service. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. And I got a young adults ministry update as well. I know you uh, all here are waiting to see Wayne and Lori. So starting this Sunday at Clay Clayton A Park, it's a BYOP, bring your own picnic. So bring your own picnic, dinner, meet there at five. You get to see Wayne and Lori. They'll harass you and bug you as only Wayne can do. Um, but I also have a youth update. Uh, we'll be kicking off September 30th, and we're going to be doing things a little different this year. Uh, we're going to be breaking it up from grade 8 and 9. You're going to be meeting from 4 to 6, and then our grade 10, 11, 12s are going to be meeting from 7 to 9. So there will be more information on all our social media outlets, so I know you'll see it there first. So let's just, let's just take a moment to, to calm our hearts and pray and focus before we offer up our worship to the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your deep love for us. Lord, as we were sinners and lost, you met us. We were broken and you fixed us. You saved us. Father, your great love has changed our lives and continues to. And I pray that we would be transformed by it and that it would force us to have an outpouring onto our community and our church body, to our families. Lord, continue just to mold us into the people that you need us to be to make change for you. So just let your Holy Spirit have his way this morning. Let us be able just to, to pour our hearts just honestly as we sing praise to you. 
and all the things that kind of clutter our mind throughout the week, Lord, whether it's going back to school, our jobs, so many things that just kind of take us away and then distract us from just being able to focus on you, Lord, the one who knows the beginning, middle, and end of our journeys, the one who brings joy, peace, and hope, and just lavishes his love on us. So we thank you, Lord, and we just pray in your name this morning. Amen.
How's that, Chris? There we go. So we're going to pretend I just came up. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's pray as we begin. 
God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit within us, leading us and guiding us in truth, uh, helping us to know you, changing and transforming us to be like you. And that's what we want. Um, and so we pray as we open your word that you would do that very thing, Lord, that you would help us to see you in the pages of scripture, that you would help us to understand the words that are written to understand what was happening in the context of those words that were spoken and God, how to live out those words even in the context of our own community all these years later. So lead us uh, for your name's sake, we pray. Amen. When we were last in the Gospel of John, we found ourselves thinking about greatness. That was a couple weeks ago, how things are so different when it comes to greatness in the kingdom of God compared to our world around us. And you might remember Jesus emphasized the point he was making by stooping down to wash the feet of his disciples. And that was an act that each of them considered to be uh, beneath themselves. It was too demeaning, too humiliating for them to actually wash each other's feet. And so Jesus did this. And you may recall as soon as he finished doing so, when he arose, he asked a question that we wrestled with two weeks ago. Do you understand what I have done? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Do you get what I'm doing here? Do you understand the point I'm making? And he said, if I, your Lord, your master, wash your feet, and this is what you need to do to one another. I've set you an example, he said, that you would do as I do. And so we were thinking about the example Jesus set, and that's what we're going to do today too, continue to look at the example of Jesus, specifically in the upper room uh, that evening of his arrest. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to John 13, and it's a quick reminder because we're jumping right where we left off. Not only has Jesus just washed their feet, risen to the table where the Passover feast is set before them, but the other thing happening in two weeks ago, like last sermon in John, was that Judas was preparing to betray Jesus. And so he's still in the room. He hasn't left yet, but it's about to happen right where we pick up our story for today. Verse 18 of chapter 13. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. And This is, again, the context. He had just announced one of them would betray him. But this is to fulfill the scripture that he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he, okay, the Messiah. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and he testified I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples, they stared at each other, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's believed to be a reference to the Apostle John, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And then, presumably some time has passed, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for a Passover feast or to give something to the poor. And as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. We'll pause there. The thing that strikes me, having read through that quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, is that John is giving us so many clues into what people in the room are feeling. Such a significant moment in the life of Christ, in the, in the life of these men. 
And I, I want to pause just to try and put ourselves in that space, even emotionally, beyond just the words we read on the page. What's Jesus feeling? How's he responding to this? It says his heart was heavy, or maybe your translation says he deeply troubled. And this is the third time now in John's gospel already we've learned that Jesus is deeply troubled by something happening. His heart's heavy. And he reaches for language to put it into words that we can understand. And specifically, his heart's heavy. He's distressed because Judas, a close friend, is about to betray him. And he knows it. And so he reaches back, actually, into the Old Testament to find language to give voice to his pain. And he quotes David in Psalm 41. And David in Psalm 41 talks about that occasion where his son Absalom rebelled against him. And part of that happened because David's close friend, trusted advisor, Ahithophel, encouraged all of this. He betrayed David, and David would speak in the Psalms about how they were like brothers. They shared bread together, the most kind of intimate form of fellowship. It's like saying, I had you over, you sat in my, my, my house at my table, and you ate my food. And Ahithophel just threw that all away. And so David wrote in Psalm 41, he who shared my bread has turned against me. uh, Jesus, knowing the Psalms, reaches all the way back, relates to what David wrote and sang, and he quotes it for himself. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And part of the pain that Jesus felt in those final hours was this throwing away of the friendship by Judas. If you've ever felt betrayal, it's one of the worst feelings I think a human being can feel. To be deeply hurt by someone that you loved so much. So that's Jesus, what he's feeling in this moment. What about the disciples? Well, they're perplexed. They don't have the benefit of hindsight that we do as readers of John's gospel. They're there in the upper room, and John, it's almost comical. He says, we just stared at one another. Perplexed. Which one of us is it? And we go, of course it's Judas. You guys know it's Judas. They didn't know it was Judas. He even left, and they didn't suspect. They thought it's just the treasurer going to do treasure stuff. Mark's gospel says that each one of them felt sorrow. They grieved in their hearts. And each one said to Jesus, is it I? A paraphrased by me, God, may it not be me. Am I the one? How about Judas? What's Judas feeling in the upper room that night? Well, we're told in this story, Judas took the bread from Jesus that was offered, just this beautiful symbol of friendship. And the moment he took it, he had to leave. And it says, out into the dark, out into the night he went. And we could gloss over that detail, but it's cool to see. I think John's a master storyteller. He started the whole gospel by saying, light has burst into darkness. And chapter after chapter, story after story, we read about the conflict between light and darkness, day and night, good and evil. Again and again, John references it. Again and again, Jesus uses the language. And so when he's saying Judas walked out away from the friendship of Jesus into the night, into the darkness, it's not that Judas just did that literally, but he did that figuratively. He turned his back on Jesus. He willingly enlisted with the forces of darkness to extinguish the light of the world. In John 3.19, it says, Lights come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. And that's Judas' story. And it's a heartbreaking scene, what we just read. Jesus offered the bread Judas took the bread, and immediately into the dark he went. What happened next? Let's keep reading at verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. 
If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. So the door closes upon Judas, and a sense of excitement, I would say, grips our story. It's almost as though Jesus pulls the 11 remaining men closer, knowing the weight of the moment, the urgency of it. Judas is left. He'll be returning soon with soldiers. Time is ticking. We're in the final hours of the life of Jesus, and feel the weight of that. What's on his heart is not just the betrayal, but knowing he's going to the Father. Glory, 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 glory. Five times in quick succession. Glory. But first, the cross. The agony of the cross, the sorrow of the cross. I imagine him a bit overwhelmed knowing these disciples have barely picked up anything I've been telling them. I'm leaving them, and the disciples are overwhelmed, saying, you're leaving us? We can't go with you? Put yourself in their shoes. I would be saying, what have I just spent three years doing with my life? Have I misplaced all of my hope in this one who I thought was Israel's salvation? Why are we talking about death? Doesn't the story end in victory? They've been with him for three weeks. In these last few weeks, he's been talking about the horror that awaits him in Jerusalem. And if it were me, I'd be wondering if it's his hour that's up. Is it my hour that's up? What happens to me in Jerusalem? All of this emotion, I think, bubbling under the surface of our story And I think John wants us to feel it because he points it out and he slows his pace down dramatically. And it seems he wants us to know these emotions of the story because everything that's going to follow in the rest of this upper room account builds off the terror of these men thinking about Jesus leaving. So we're now entering a part of the Bible that the, the theologians call a farewell discourse. For the next four chapters, we are not leaving this scene. Judas has just left. We're not seeing Judas again until chapter 18. We're going to sit in this moment with Jesus, with the 11, and them going, you're leaving? What do we do? And he's going to start talking about their future. He's going to say, I'm leaving so I can welcome you at a later date. I'm going to go to prepare a place so that where I am, you can be with me. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back. And he's going to talk to them about the sorrow that awaits them and the joy that awaits them and the mission that awaits them. And he's going to talk to them about the Holy Spirit who's going to come and empower them and guide them and lead them to help them to be able to accomplish the purposes and plans of God. He's going to talk about all of those things in the next four chapters. And John slows the pace down, sets the stage so that we understand what's happening and how everything flows out of this moment of Jesus leaving and the guy's terrified. But before he tells them all about the future, what he does is he basically tells them what they should do while they wait for him. Here's what I expect of you while I'm off preparing a place that I'm going to welcome you to. And what is it that he expects? We'll finish our passage for today, verse 34. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then something kind of fun happens. Jesus is like using his precious final moments to talk about love. And Peter, 
immediately goes back to the previous conversation. Lord, where are you going? (laughs) Jesus replies, right, ever so patiently, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And Jesus answered, will you really, or Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But again, what's gripping the narrative is Jesus leaving and the guy's going, what do we do? Where are you going? How come we can't come? And in the context of all of that, a new command is given. I want to think about this with what's left of this sermon. I'll start by pointing out this new command is simple enough that a toddler could memorize it. Love one another as I have loved you. It's simple enough that a toddler could have some comprehension of it, yet it's profound enough that a man like me, who's followed Christ for decades and pastored for two dozen years, looks at this and feels embarrassed often at how little I comprehend this great command and how much I struggle still to live it out in my relationships. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Maybe you'd say, but is it really a new command? What's new about it? Point out a couple things. One, there's a a new pattern, I'll call it. As I have loved you. Prior to this new command, the average Jewish person understood that they needed to love their neighbor, right? Right? Leviticus 19. Love your neighbor even as you love yourself. But they defined neighbor as fellow Jew, and they even defined neighbor as fellow Jew who's just like me. And then the measure of love was not as I have loved you, but it was as you love yourself. So as you might imagine, they took this great command and lowered the bar as far as they could. And here Jesus is taking that bar and putting it right back into its rightful place. He's deepening their understanding of what love looks like by pointing to his own example and saying, do what I've done. What you've seen me do, do that. That's what it looks like. He basically put flesh on the command for all of us to look at even all of these years later. He's saying, look back at all the time that you spent with me. Remember me washing your feet. Remember how I treated people. Remember how I loved you. Remember how I treated Judas. Remember me going to the cross and the the, the sorrow that I went through. And remember me on the cross in payment of your sins. Remember it all and then do that. As I have loved you, you must love one another. So we're far past mushy sentimentality, empty words or feelings that come and go. We're talking here about concrete acts of service, selflessness, sacrifice, servant-hearted expressions of love. Jesus is saying, here's the example for you. My life is the pattern, it's the template, it's the shape, it's the mold into which you conform your life. Think about it this way. Um, I love Legos. Um, My kids, if you're watching, cover your ears. I had kids so I could get more Legos. And so Mike and I built quite a good Lego collection. I still have some of it on my shelf. My wife and my daughter know when Christmas rolls around. What I love is to build Lego still, especially Star Wars Lego. And so this was one I was waiting for. It's uh, Boba Fett Slave One. Anyways, I wanted to build this. So I dumped a thousand some pieces onto the table. This is what I wanted it to become. The only way I get there is by what? Following the pattern, right? 
who knows what I would have built otherwise. Step by step by step, I looked in, I surveyed the details, and I did as I saw. And at the end, I ended up with this, which is in my office. And this is what we do with the life of Christ. We say, I want to become like Christ. We open up the word and we see and we listen and we hear and we submit, we surrender and we apply and we do as we see. And over time, the spirit of God makes us more and more and more like Jesus. Another way we can think about it is this. The famous words of the apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, this incredible description of love. You can read it on your own as I'm talking. But in his commentary, James Montgomery Boise, speaking about this passage, notes something that's, I think, astute. He points out, very simply, Jesus is God. God is love. So therefore, we could actually just replace the word love with Jesus. We'd have this beautiful description of what he is, who he is. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus doesn't envy, he doesn't boast, he's not proud, he doesn't dishonor others, he's not self-seeking or easily angered. He rejoices in the truth, he delights in it, he always trusts, always perseveres, always hopes. Jesus, he, he doesn't fail us, amen? And so I believe the great work of God in my life is that I would enjoy him as he turns it into this. That Curtis becomes patient and kind, and doesn't envy and doesn't boast and isn't proud and doesn't delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. I think this is the work God wants to do in me, but yet again, I look at the slide beside me or the one on Thursday night you're looking above me, and I go, God, I've got so far to go. So far to go. It's humbling. I don't yet love the way Jesus has loved me. Anyone in this room? Truth is, I still don't understand how loved I am by Jesus. I'm still sorting that out to my final breath, knowing the depth and the breadth of God's love. And that was true of the men that were gathered with Jesus in the upper room. They didn't love one another with the intensity we're reading about. They were jealous. They were arguing, squabbling over who's better than the other. No way they were washing each other's feet. Yet you look at the transformation of their lives. God's incredible patience with them, and it gives me so much hope for my own life. And all of this to say, it's striking that in the final hours of Jesus' life, of all the things he could talk about, here he is again, saying, I'm leaving, I'm coming back. In the meantime, love. None of this love you guys do I'm talking what you've seen me do. That's love. And as I have done for you, so you should do for one another. And so as I wrestle through this great command, this new command, I think just a simple application of this whole passage, perhaps the most important one, is that you and I would wake up in the morning and just say, God, would you help me today to be mindful of how deeply loved I am by Christ and then pattern my day after that. God, when I'm interacting with Sue or the kids or our CHBC staff, my coworkers, people at school, when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, when I'm hurt, when I'm betrayed, would you help me, God, to love as you've loved me. Grow me, mature me, help me. 
a new pattern. I think another thing here, a worded a new object. Notice there's a movement from love your neighbor as yourself to a more intimate and defined as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Phew, we don't have to love our neighbors anymore. No. Jesus emphasized in his teaching many other places. We still love our neighbors. He even said we have to love our enemies. We have to love everyone in the world. That hasn't changed, but what he clarifies here, I think, is that the primary place of Christian love is within the local church. The place where love is learned, the place where love is is first poured out. The great experiment of love begins right here in a room like this with one another, and then it pours out into the world. So much so, Jesus said, that in fact, if you do this thing that I asked you to do as you wait for my return, love one another, and the way I've loved you, the world's going to watch. They're going to take note of your love, and they're going to know you're my disciples. By this... All men will know you're mine. You love one another. And here's where I get to step on feet. This new command cannot be obeyed if we live our lives independently of other Christians. If you think you can have a healthy Christian life without the church, you cannot fulfill this command. Because your life was meant to be woven in together with brothers and sisters where you give and you receive love. Where your gifts benefit them and their gifts benefit you. This new command cannot be obeyed apart from that. As Dave put it last week, if all our Christian faith is, is a punch card of church attendance where we casually come and go without any meaningful interaction with other believers, we cannot Fulfill this command. We're choosing to disobey it, to disregard it, and say, give me something else that's important while while I wait for you to come. And so as we enter this new season of life together at CHBC, our leadership is urging each one of us to think about this new command. Say, take seriously Um, what Jesus is saying here, and we've been taking it seriously, like, so that you know, we meet regularly, and we feel the burden of what Scripture says, which is we shepherd as those who will give account for your souls. That's a sobering thought for us, and it weighs heavy that even though we can add an extra service and have 150 people here on a weekly basis, it weighs heavy that even still there are hundreds that are not here. And we're worried about how people are doing. We're wondering if their connection is there. Are they being cared for? Are they loving? And the answer isn't hire another pastor. This is the work of more than one or two people or an elder board. This is us. Every one of us has been given this new command. It takes all of us to fulfill it. And so some of that can happen in a room like this where 50 can gather at a time, but even then we come and go And it's hard to exchange love at a deep level. I'm thankful that we have other ministry groups where we can love a little bit more practically and in depth. Things like the ladies ministry, men's ministry, young adults, youth. Those are good things too. But we're also asking that, you know, if it works with your health, your occupation, your schedule, that you consider being a part of a community group here at College Heights Baptist Church too, in which we can live life together on a weekly basis. We're thinking like three families, maybe 12 people living together, caring, not living together. Pull that back. (laughs) Living life together, unless you're really committed. 
working together to fulfill this command. That can be as simple as gathering already with people in your bubble. Maybe you have a couple families you're in contact with and just reach out and let us know, hey, I am connected. We can put our focus in finding others who aren't. Or maybe you want connection and you don't know many people in the church. Email this same address and we'll help connect you. Or maybe you have questions. I'm not being clear. Email me, groups at mychbc.ca, and we'll help you there. But as a start, what we're imagining is that we can gather in homes together, uh, watch the weekly worship service, pray together, maybe chat about the sermon, enjoy a meal. We think this is a way to make a large church small, especially in a season where we're disconnected. That's not a new idea. It's always been this way. If you go back to the book of Acts chapter 2, in one day, 3,000 people were added to the church. Acts chapter 2 doesn't end with a big building plan. They met in the temple courtyard and they broke bread in small homes. And two chapters later, the effectiveness of the way those people loved each other, two chapters later, the church is probably around 10,000 people already. Large assembly, but life lived together in community, breaking bread. And that's what we're hoping can happen here so that even if three months from now we get scaled back and we can't do this, we know that we're still connecting. Or way down the road in churches where there's persecution around the world, this is how they're functioning. And so we pray that you'll help us care for you by at least considering whether this fits in this season of your life. And all of this sets up, I'll stop, the verses to follow next week. I talked about a new pattern to the new command, a new object of the new command. Next week we'll get into a new power says, you must do this. And I say back, I can't. (laughs) Loving the way Jesus loves me is not instinctive. I need help, Lord. I need a helper, Lord. I need a powerful helper, Lord. And he's going to spend the next chapter saying, don't you worry, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he will help you fulfill the command of love until the day I return. A new command I give to you. Not a new suggestion. Not a new idea. Not a new possibility. Not a new life option. Not even a divine invitation where Jesus is saying, you know, please, just love one another. Not even a step in a series of steps to the successful life. If you do this, you'll be happy. A command. The command. And our fulfillment of the command demonstrates whether we're even Christians. Whether we even understand what this is about. Our fulfillment of this command demonstrates to the world whether what we're talking about is even true. What I love about John, I've got to stop, I know. But if you read through his letters to the early church at the end of the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I bet you anything, you can't go 15 to 30 seconds without reading the word love. In fact, I'll summarize 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John right now. Love, 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 love. You know why? John never forgot this moment in the upper room. He understood Jesus was returning. He didn't know when. And Jesus left them something to do. Love as you've been loved. And it never left his mind. Always on his heart is the new command on ours. Let's pray. Invite the worship team to come. Thank you, God, for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for the Apostle John and 
your Holy Spirit, inspiring him to, to slow the pace down and let us into these intimate moments. Thank you, God, for your great patience, not just with these men in the upper room, but with each one of us today. Thank you for this reminder today about the command to love one another as you, Jesus, have loved us. We pray that you would help us to pattern our lives after you. To take time and know you and to see you in the pages of Scripture so that we know what it looks like to love. Give us an increasing love and affection for other believers, Lord, for each one of us that we would think of practical ways, tangible expressions of sacrificial love that we can demonstrate to one another. We pray that as our community watches us love one another, that many, many more would come to know and praise you. Lord, we need your power to do this. We need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us more and more like Jesus. And we pray that you would do this for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. We ask it for the glory of your name. Amen.
you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am.
joining us. We hope that you have a great and blessed week. Too high.